Uh, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm a bit. Remember, I remember getting told off by having a pornographic icon um, on the what? <laughs> on like OGS at one point. I had a vaguely pornographic icon like this. I don't this, even remember this, that. Well, wow, isn't because uh, your face look like a dick? Welcome down to the abyssal lair of the radiophonic sea creatures. Petition your local politician to have the word cuckfots added to the dictionary because I, Tokyo Choo Choo, am going to be your host today. And uh, with me as always are two knock slacking cuckfutters. It's Human Metal and Brack. How are you guys? How are you, Human Metal? Would you, would you like to explain that term to us? It's nonsense. It doesn't okay. mean anything. I thought it meant some, you know, was assembled from some specific uh, things and meant one specific thing apparently word, not it, it's it's not rocket science the word cuckfuts just sounds rude okay yes it definitely sounds rude but everything you say sounds rude so i, I like i'm not sure what you're trying to say that is definitely not true shut your cunt mouth i'm sorry i think we're all kind of bit of low energy today because it's very hot, hot outside and i speak, just want to I want Speak to for yourself, human metal. I, I took a line of two before this. Oh, obviously. Well, that's your normal <laughs> procedure but before the podcast. But still, I would like to submerge myself into a bathtub of crushed naked ice. And naked ladies, maybe. I don't know. Mm. But that would I make think. it hot again, so that's counterproductive to, you know. Hey, naked ladies are never counterproductive. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> All right. What are we doing today? Well, what you well, what are you doing, uh, uh, Human Metal? This is the shallows. All right, after all. So I'm starting. Hu Good. Hu sure. Hu 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 human Metal has literally forgotten how the podcast works. Yes, <laughs> my brain so has long. been severely fried, so it's even worse than usual because it has been already damaged <laughs> severely <laughs> several times. So uh, yeah, what have, have I been doing? All right, uh, I've been playing Odin Sphere Life Razir, which is the remaster a bit remake of uh, an old ps2 game from vanillaware the guys who also made muramasa and dragon's crown uh who are probably most well known or most recognizable by the beautiful art style that all their games like uh, <laughs> exhibit and uh, odin's Sphere is like this kind of mix of bit action rpg bit side scroll beat em up brawler hack and slash like a little bit of everything but it's got a nice story you're playing like five different characters and uh you know, play through their story who intersect in different parts and uh then you fight cool bosses and everything it's a really really good looking game that plays really well uh i heard a lot of people had or not a lot of people uh, a lot of people already like the ps2 version the original one but uh the ps4 version that i'm playing right now is actually much better they fixed some of the smaller kinks in the fighting system made it better and more dynamic and everything and uh the upgrade system as well so yeah i'm having a lot of fun with that i've played through three storylines so far so two more to go and i'm really looking forward to seeing uh <laughs> the ending of the game because so far the storyline for each character is pretty much like stand alone even though they intersect with the other characters but it's like one continuous plot for that character and then the next one and then you get to the next one and at the very end apparently all their storylines like flow together and you can apparently decide which one uh, which character you pick and play so that's a very interesting idea and how it works out and yeah it's just super fun to play i think it's uh, you got a lot of different ways of you know to slash through your enemies and you got special attacks and you know uh, special skills and everything it's just cool uh i enjoyed it very much and like i said it looks beautiful i can really recommend this game <laughs> so far so yeah good stuff uh yeah that sounds pretty cool actually because i'm actually a big fan of muramasa mm -hmm. uh i played it a little bit on the wii but i really played the hell out of it when it came to the Vita, and it's just like it's a really cool game yeah i like, really hope they're they're gonna do a uh, um, port uh, for the ps4 of muramasa again uh because i didn't i i barely touched the wii version and uh, I don't know why even, uh, but 
And I did, did, didn't own a Vita, so I hope since they brought a pro version of Dragon's Crown out as well for the PS4, so I thought mm-hmm. yeah, maybe we're going to get a pro version of Muramasa as well. Yeah, so, and, yeah. And, and like the, the game looks amazing on the Vita. Like on the so Wii, it actually looks a little bit uh, I don't know, pixely, but the Vita version is very slick looking and very like it looks amazing. So if they put that shit in like full, uh, 4K, HDR, whatever it's called, then it would look amazing as well so yeah i'm hoping I mean, it will do that audience feel looks like i said fantastic uh, i love just the the art design and the backgrounds on the characters the animation everything in this looks so finely crafted and i yeah i love it i love the style of uh, that um that particular developer and i wonder what they're going to do next they're developing something i think it's called the 13 guardians or something and we haven't really seen anything conclusive for that yet. Like the last trailer was really weird. That didn't give you any hint what the game actually is going to turn out to be, what it's going to play like. <laughs> it's yeah, like, weird. So It doesn't even show if this is like a, a, a turn-based uh, anything or whatever. Yeah. Like, it, it could be like turn-based, it could be like an action game. It yeah. could be everything. And we no don't know fucking yet. idea. So I, I really want, want to learn more about that. But so far... I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Odin's Sphere, maybe get Dragon's Crown after that, and I hope they're gonna bring Muramasa over as well. Chuchu, have you played any of the Vanillaware games? Uh, no, I I have an absolute no idea what you're talking about, so I just I'm just gonna stay stum. I'm gonna uh, send you a trailer for Odin's Sphere after we're done with the recording. I oh know yeah. What do you think about the art style? All right, yeah, no, please don't do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm joking, not taking it. Um, but if it has a, like a good Japanese, uh, like manga esque uh, art style, I'm, I'm all down for that. I'm, I'm assuming it has that kind of style. Yeah, it's it's kind of a weird mix between like storybooky look and and uh, manga look. So yeah, it's it's kind of unique, but I really like it. Oh, that's cool. uh, it looks at least Muramasa looks very much. Uh, uh, like the the art style from like the great wave of kanagawa i don't i think you're probably familiar with that painting like the the japanese painting with like the huge waves on it it's very famous uh oh yeah the, the, the yeah the woodblock paintings yeah i know yeah it looks a um, lot like it looks a lot like that style at least Muramasa does mixed with anime style all right so like traditional japanese art mixed with anime um yeah well, and it cool. looks it really it really makes it a nice look also muramasa which if you play that for some reason the food in that game looks amazing they have like super nicely head drawn food for like every time yeah, it's the same for this sphere. you got a cooking gotta... mechanic in that as well and so many different dishes and it looks so fucking delicious i got hungry yeah. every time i played that fucking game it's ridiculous <laughs> oh it's, it's hilarious to see like i remember the other, their last game did the same thing and like if you uh, you fought like a boss fight and then the next level between levels you're eating the boss because you're like, oh, you just beat a dragon, and you're like, oh, what should we make with this dragon? Let's fry the dragon, uh, fry the <laughs> dragon, and eat him in between levels. And it's like, oh yeah, that's kind of hilarious. Yeah, mm. yeah, good oh. stuff. <laughs> yeah, you got to get some of that foreign meat in. How about you, Brack? What have you been up to uh, of recent times? So yeah, I-, I tried to escape the heat by going to the movies a lot, and uh, I watched two movies in a row. I went to watch two superhero movies in a row. I went to see Ant Man and the Wasp, and uh, it's a movie with with people in it with yeah. with the cast. I think there's a director, probably probably a director, probably a writer as well. It's probably like a me- the most meaningless movie of like all the Marvel movies. It's just it's just lays there. It's like it's like not like I, I enjoyed myself watching the movie, but like afterwards it feels like you just went through a black hole and like because nothing happened. You know what I mean? Oh, like that's you a shame. don't you don't really remember anything from it. It's like oh, there's some cool action scenes. It, it's really not that funny. Like the the first anime was kind of funny. This one really wasn't, in my opinion. Like they repeat all of the jokes from the first one again. Like all the the same jokes. It's like, guys, come on, think of some new jokes. Like well... I know it's like it's been years ago, but you don't have to tell me the same jokes over again that I've already seen. And uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's that's kind of damning because that shows you how much input probably uh, Edward Wright had on the first one, and then for the next one. <laughs> Peyton Reed couldn't come up with any, uh, and the writing staff couldn't come up with any, anything new, so they just rehashed what they had. Uh, hmm. But uh, one thing that's that's good about it, it has the best, literally the best uh, de-aging CGI sequence, where they have like a young uh, Michael Douglas mm. at, at one scene. It's like, oh my God, uh, and a young Michael Michelle Pfeiffer. It's like, damn, it really looks like a young Michelle Pfeiffer and a young Michael Douglas. Like, it's, it's probably the best 
the least uncanny valley version of of that that uh, premise of like deaging someone. So that yeah, I think Mar- Marvel are, are pretty good at doing that. Um, if I remember, the original Ant Man had a young Michael Douglas in it, which was which was pretty damn convincing. I I, I felt the same way that you probably felt about uh, this Michael Douglas about about that one. In the first Ant Man movie, but also I thought the uh, the scene in Civil War where yeah, young Tony Stark, young Tony Stark, that was pretty good. I felt that one is I felt the CGI a lot in that one. I thought Kurt Russell was actually a lot better, like young Kurt Russell All in right. uh, Guardians Two. Guardians Two, yeah. Well, we I definitely think... come a long way since that that fucking guy in Tron Legacy. What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Jeff Bridges, yeah. Uh... Yeah, that yeah. looks horrible. Like that movie looks amazing, except for that. Like that 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 shit looks terrible. And uh, there's one there's one fun thing about it when it, sometimes they change size of cars. That like cars that get changed size, and they do some fun stuff with it. It's like, oh, I really want to pick a controller and play this because it looks like fun to play. <laughs> they never like yeah, that's that's. But it was okay. Right. But I've also seen Incredibles two. And like Incredibles 2 isn't all that great of a movie in my opinion. It's like it's 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 really, but it's way more fun, way more funny, and it just uh, has so many. The action sequences in there are just amazing. Like they're so well thought out. They do so much much creative shit with all the with all the powers, and and uh, yeah, it's just really amazing. Like like it's really incredible. I tried to say amazing, but that's that's wrong. It's incredible. But uh, yeah. yeah, that that movie is, is is so much fun. Like it's it's. Uh, it just really put Ant Man to shame with with how much funnier and how much more uh, expressive and explosive the se- action sequences are. I he- I heard like uh, a lot of mixed reviews about Incredibles too, so it's it's nice to hear uh, a oh. positive thing. I understand the negative reviews because the story isn't all that great, and it has like a plot twist that like a blind person could see coming. Like there's no way that you won't see coming that that there's a that plus the, that plot twist is happening. So that's a little bit uh, disappointing. But uh, as in like a, as a superhero movie, this is much more uh, like a, a more standard superhero movie compared to the first one, I think. And uh, doing, but it's really great at doing that. It's like it has like amazing action sequences action scenes that like put other superhero movies to shame okay Sounds also fun. how did also elastigirl's dick so that's that's all i'm saying elastigirl's dick tick you don't know what, what tick means tick yeah. no thick as in fat e c k no she has, a, she has a giant ass that's all i'm saying that's what i'm trying to <laughs> oh. say okay like <laughs> yeah i also i first sometimes i'm forgetting that you're so old that you don't know what yes. How young people talk. Well, th- you, so you say thick for a big ass? Um, I see, in, in my generation, you call someone thick, it's either they're stupid or fat. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like. Maybe she's stupid gener- too, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, man, let's the girl, she's so thick. <laughs> <laughs> she's a bit <laughs> stupid because she didn't get the plot twist, even though we as watchers would, would cut through it immediately. So, but uh, oh, so just just for a second, when when I thought you said it, Elastigirl's dick, I literally, I just imagine it's like a like, like this is kind of weird because I feel like Chuchu always hears the things he wants to hear, and sure. like and it's always like something sexual with like with dicks. It's so a I'm self, like, I'm not it's sure a self fulfilling prophecy. Let's well, leave it at I'll that. I'll tell you what. Uh, no, I have a question actually, Brack. How do you think it stacks up against the first one? That's what I want to know. That's hard to say I, because the first one is uh, I watched it at the perfect time when I was a, was a kid, so it's impossible to stand up against like my nostalgic feelings about the first one. It's literally impossible. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and it, it was before the superhero craze, right? And so it was kind of like the first one that does, does like a superhero movie really well. Huh? One of the first uh, people like. This is before like all the Marvel movies. All the Marvel movies and shit came after Incredibles, so That's it's true. it's. Uh, and people wanted a sequel to this for years. Yeah, for years. It's like fourteen years ago that the the the, the, the first Incredibles came out. You yeah, know what I mean? Got, people got more and more frustrated because with Pixar would do shit like Cars Car- two and three, and you know, Finding Dory, which wasn't all great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, weird choices there. 
Well, yeah, Inside it's, Out it's, was great. Inside Out's great. Oh, it's yeah. probably the it's the best non Toy Story sequel that they've made. So mm. that's something. I'm not sure how many sequels they actually they have actually made, but this is one of the better ones. It's great. It's a great movie. It's a really fun time, and uh, like also visually, it just looks amazing. Like this, this is probably one of the best looking like animated movies I've ever seen. Well, from Pixar, so- I expected something like this. Yeah, yeah, but like like some of the Pixar movies, they don't really do anything unique with their visual style and stuff, and this one does. Oh, that's cool. Okay, yeah, I, I, I look forward to seeing that film. I think I, I won't go to see it at the cinema. It's not that, it's not, you know, how expensive the cinema is out here in Japan, but uh, it's not that type of movie that I go to the cinema, but I'll certainly definitely catch it on DVD or Blu-ray or something. It's Because, it's, yeah, I am interested to see it, so that's cool. Uh, I'm happy to hear it's good. I think it's the kind of movie you should see at the cinema because it just looks so good and there's so much like amazing action in it. Like that's the kind of thing I want. I want to go see it through in the cinema, right? Like amazing, yeah. a- amazing action scenes and stuff like that. So maybe yeah, you should uh, reconsider that if you if no, you get no. the chance. The problem no, is the he... major audience on that movie will be kids, and yeah. I really don't. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to have that kind of movie experience. I, so. My my major issue is like it costs like thirty bucks to go to the cinema out here, and uh, so I have I have to really pick and choose. What? Yeah, the, the, fuck? Cin- the, the cinema is like fucking daylight robbery out here. Fucking All right, hell. The, the fucking Blu-rays uh, in 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 Japan are super expensive as well. I forgot. Ridiculous. Yes, they, yeah. they are. They have to you have to but you have to pay like about like at least fifty dollars or something to pick up a Blu-ray out here. It's nuts. fucking nuts. Nuts. It's. Yeah. It is nuts. On the plus side, you can get hot dogs in the cinema. I mean, that's. I mean, I don't know if that's standard out there in Germany. It probably is with your love of sausages and stuff. But uh, no, no, not in, really. I think only popcorn and nachos is standard here. It's like it's like you can get like uh, uh, hot dogs and beers in the cinema, and it's like shit. Yes, in England, you definitely can't do that. Oh, we can definitely get hot do- hot dogs and beers in the cinema. Definitely oh. beers. I'm not sure about the hot dogs. Yeah, never... definitely beers but, uh, for us as well, but not hot dogs. Not that I know of, in, anyway. In England, and I thank God for it every day, you can't get beer in the cinema because oh, no, if that... you could get beers in the cinema, it would just turn it into like a full-on pub and then there'd be, 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 be basically like people just brawling in the cinema. And like that, I think the, 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 uh, the percentage of, the, of getting stabbed would rise dramatically in the cinema. You'd be sitting there watching Jurassic Park or whatever, and then you get shanked in the side by some Larry football fan. I don't know. It'd oh, be terrible. British people. They're just the worst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. Um, there's, there's a reason I live in Japan, and part of that reason was I was really just desperate to escape from England. But you know what? That's the city in England. I love the countryside of England. Um, my heart belongs to the countryside. Beautiful rivers, beautiful forests, nice people. As soon as you go to anywhere built up, though, yeah, that percentage starts creeping in. As soon as I get to any city border, I'm like, I'm literally putting body armor on. Um, anyway, uh, talking about uh, English people and hooliganism, the World Cup was uh, just has just passed, so I enjoyed the World Cup immensely. And actually, for me, it was the best World Cup of my life. Uh, so, Even though your team didn't win, or your teams, so to speak. That's, that's the thing. Like, for me, the, uh, the of course I want England to win. And if not England, I would like Japan to win. Um, or Croatia. <laughs> yeah, or, or maybe Croatia. Definitely anybody but France, basically, who... Who won? One, yes. So, <laughs> fucking hell. Um, I think one of the biggest pops for me was when Croatia scored their equalizing goal. I jumped off the couch and screamed to the heavens like I'd fucking like England had just won the World Cup. But uh, anyway, um, the reason it was so great is because I got into the real international spirit of things. Uh, so. In the past, when I watched the World Cup, I would only watch my team's games. I would only watch England's games. Just follow their progress. As soon as they were knocked out, that's it. I don't give a shit about the World Cup anymore. Like this type feeling. Uh, Then when I moved to Japan, of course, then it became about Japan and England. I had two teams to vote for, so great. Then finally, the last World Cup in Brazil, after England and Japan were knocked out, I felt like... I wanted to see more World Cup. I wanted to actually see who won the thing. So I actually started watching other teams' games, and I watched pretty much almost all of the games 
in the like from like the quarterfinals onwards or the semifinals or whatever. And I found like I had a really good time doing that. So this World Cup, for the first time ever, straight from the off, I just decided I'm going to watch as many games as I can physically get in. And I watched so much soccer. Like I watched, <laughs> I watched about seventy percent of the games in there. Like I watched all the quarterfinals, all the semifinals, um, obviously the final. Um, but I watched a whole bunch of group stages. I watched so much soccer that, quite frankly, I can't remember much about the World Cup because I watched <laughs> too much. <laughs> Do you know Overkill. what I mean? All, all the, yeah, all the games start blending together. So if you can ask me, though, what happened in that game, I'd be like, uh, I don't really remember, but it was good fun. <laughs> but I really, really loved it. And then, so during that period, of course, when you're watching that much soccer, you get that itch. Like, man, I want to play a soccer video game. Like, the the feeling sort of came to me very strongly. I want, I want to play something. I want to play FIFA or something. So, you know, as a very good business strategy, FIFA was heavily discounted um, on on PlayStation Store. So I decided, yeah, sure, why not? Because for me, I'm not that big a soccer fan. Um, I only really love the World Cup. I don't really care about league soccer or whatever. Uh, and I find if you have one soccer video game, that's it for the system. That's all you're ever going to need. You only need one because I don't care about you know the updated player brackets and all that shit. So I decided to buy... Um, FIFA Soccer, FIFA 18, the the newest one, because it was heavily discounted, and was delighted to find that FIFA had actually given you like a free download of the World Cup with with the updated brackets and the proper teams from the World Cup. They have similar for the previous versions too, right? Or at least uh, for some of them. For some of them. I think it's a recent (laughs) thing. It surprised me because in the old days, when I used to play uh, a bit of FIFA, like they would release the league game and then when the world cup they tried to ca- ca- cash grab it and they would release a separate thing like i i literally have on the playstation thing i have like fifa world cup 2010 like do you know what i mean like as a standalone thing so i was really happy to find and i didn't expect it because you know i don't follow fifa that well that much so i was delighted to find that and it's like yeah damn um so ironically i haven't played it i mean i, I played like one like world cup and got knocked out pretty quickly in it because it was the first thing i did and you need a little bit of practice before you get good at that game but uh then i saw i started a league with my hometown portsmouth best place in the world to get stabbed um and uh going through you know like the league and the fa cup and stuff and getting into like the business minutiae of like managing your club of like setting up your players and training them like Pokemon and then buying new players and going through that sort of real time business negotiation, um, like mini game you have when you want to get a new player in, um, it adds a lot of atmosphere and it's just, I forgot just how much fun that is. And it's really addictive. It's, it's pretty much exactly like playing Pokemon with a much better battle system because the battle <laughs> system is actually playing a game of soccer. Um, <laughs> and the, the, it has all the excitement of a soccer game, you know, like like when you score, it goes like, Yarrr! and when you get hammered, it's like, fucking get your fucking player. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, I am suffering from FIFA addiction. If I don't play FIFA every day, I feel like I'm going to die at the moment. So I think it's like it's 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 like one step down from Call of Duty addiction on the level of like uh, <laughs> you know worst video game addictions you can get, but uh, it's it's a fantastic fun and I've been enjoying it. Unfortunately, it has stopped every other video game dead in its track. So I haven't played God of War since oh, we no. last spoke. Yeah, I mean, I'm, don't don't get me wrong. I'm gonna go back to it um, and finish it up. I have got summer vacation coming very soon, so I'm definitely gonna do that because that's an awesome awesome game but fifa is so addictive and i want to play it so much that it's just just cut out everything so there you go great stuff um any any really didn't listen to anything about fifa because fifa i don't don't really give a fuck about fifa (laughs) seriously like uh. i don't give a damn about sports games in general but i you know i enjoyed the world cup so if 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 anybody wants to know how much of an asshole Brack is, I, I here's a little anecdote for you, right? England had just got knocked out of the World Cup, so as an Englishman, <laughs> I was I was crushed, you know. I, my feeling was really down. Like, it's it's hard to explain. Well, you know, if you like soccer, you know how it is. You know, like the, you you have that feeling, you know, that your country can do it. And when they're going further than they have for many many years, you get that real 
sensation that they might win it. And I think if you like soccer, like I do, like one of your dreams is maybe to see your country win the World Cup. I mean, human metal has it every every fucking eight years or something with being German, but so it's all good for him. But I'm, I'm from England. They've never won it in my lifetime. So, you know, like the rest of England, I was really excited about it and devastated when they got knocked out. And then I checked Skype and Brack's like, oh, I'm so happy England were out of the World Cup. You're know, fucking English people. I'm like, man. Well, I did say exactly like that. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> there was probably more, more curse words in there. Yeah, but I tell you what, uh, at that I love Brack to bits, but at that point I wanted to punch him in his fucking face, <laughs> like a real Englishman. Yeah, yeah, that, that's very English of you. Like, like <laughs> you just like explain to like, like why, <laughs> why I don't feel bad about the English losing. <laughs> like it couldn't have happened to a uh, nicer country. That's all I'm saying. Oh man, see, this is oh. Yeah, I didn't want the Fran- I didn't want the France to the, the the French to win either. No, I don't want the French to win. But I tell you what, next time I come across a fucking Netherlands flag, I'm gonna wipe my butt with it. You fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm not worried because you, your dumbass probably picks a French flag anyway by accident because it's the same colors. Yeah, uh, so actually, I don't I don't have any idea what the Netherlands flag looks like, and I think that's everything you need to know about the Netherlands right there. Um, and I love how that, a lot of how a lot no, of people it, made it's made, everything you need to know about your education. But that's or, speaking or of, of you know flags looking the same. I lo- like that a lot of people were trying to make fun of Germany when they like lost so disastrously in their you know two of their games, and they used instead the flag of Belgium. It's like yeah, that's see. Not- speaking of a country who, who kind of deserve to win, like like I prefer Belgium yeah. winning over. France or over uh, uh, England or Germany. Well, Belgium, it's like, Bel- Belgium did beat England twice. Yes. <laughs> and I'm happy about that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, they do make nice chocolate. Um, England make good stabbing weapons. Uh, and with that, we're going to move out of the shallows and into the depths. <laughs> Welcome back to the depths. So today on the depths, we are going to be talking about uh, the career of Michael Mann. Uh, so we're going to be going through his films in chronological order, and you know, basically just uh, well, yeah, just talking about them because let's face it, that's what people do on a podcast. They talk about things. Um, so yeah, let let's go through Michael Mann's uh, uh, discography. Um, Filmography, sorry, that's I think that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, so uh, briefly before we start, what do you think about Michael Mann? Just in just in general terms. Oh, should I start? No, yeah. I, I'm I'm a big fan of Michael Mann. I'm a big fan of his aesthetics. Uh, mm. Like and he has like this this uh, hyper masculine crime uh, deal. That's just like what his characters are always like this hyper masculine blue collar criminals and. Uh, the way he does it with like the su- super strong silent types, and the way he he portrays those characters and the, the and the environments they're in is always super interesting. And I, I really like uh, just the way he shoots, like the way his 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 uh, all his movies look like they take place between two and four in the morning on like a wet like pavement LA streets with like neon lights coming down on everything, and it just looks very gloom gloom and very early in the morning, and it just looks very like very like amazing, and I just love that 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 style. Yeah, I uh, visual wise, I have to agree. I really like the uh, way he builds atmosphere um, through music and visuals in his movies. Uh, you know, just downtrodden LA, whatever, and uh, especially during nighttime and stuff like that. And we get to that once we talk about a specific movie of his. But I think story-wise, so far, I've, I, I th- the movie I enjoy most is where he breaks a bit with his usual crime masculine character sensibilities. So, uh, yeah. I haven't seen that many movies of his, but, uh, but uh, I definitely like the one the most where he doesn't really do that. 
Um, uh, me personally, uh, I like his movies. However, as his career um, goes on, I think his tropes become quite see-through, uh, especially towards the back end of his career. And I feel like he's a director whose whose peak has passed. I think. And I think it's it's pretty much only downhill from here. Although his filmography up until this point is is pretty great, um, as we're going to talk about. But I, I feel um, that that certain style is becoming more outdated as it goes on. So I, to be honest, I don't really expect much from from his movies as they come out in the future. But you never know. You he's never also know. he's also still have an ace in the yeah, but, but his yeah. career is so long. That we're doing like uh, that. That there are movies that are like takes on his early work. You know what I mean? Mm. Like there are like nostalgic takes on on his work. Like like Drive, for example. We're going to talk about Thief next. Maybe we should just go go into this uh, discussion about Thief. But uh, Drive, the movie Drive, is almost like like uh, a, a specific kind of take on the movie Thief. Those movies are very similar, and uh, both in like visual style, music. Uh, and story so like we are we reached this point where people are like uh parodying and and uh having like uh different takes on his early work on his style sure i would say though yeah. that especially drive as an example is more stylized still in terms of visuals like it is it feels a bit more surreal uh in a lot of parts than michael mann movies do especially of those today since he switched over to digital camera uh, uh handicam st- uh, hand uh, that's why I specifically mentioned Thief, stuff. because Thief is the most the most uh, uh, expressive of his like eighties nostal- uh, right. neon and I haven't colored seen style. Man, so, yeah, I, yeah. I, I I haven't seen Thief. However, uh, I do I do agree. Some of the especially the opening sequence of of Drive with the car chase and uh, you know that very sort of slow awesome car chase that opens Drive. That's very Michael Mannish. When you look at that, and yeah. you know, if you were to say who directed this, one of the first things that probably, you know, would spring to your mind would be, oh, that's, that's probably Michael Mann, right? <laughs> but no, it's not. But, um, but uh, yeah, I haven't seen Thief. Brack. Br- Drive is awesome, by the way. But uh, please tell us about Thief, because yeah, I think you're the only one of the three of us who've seen it. Uh, Thief is about, uh, uh, it's like a crime movie about a blue collar criminal, like extremely blue collar criminal, played by James Caan, who is like a. Uh, he steals diamonds. I still only steal diamond, uh, uh, diamonds and cash and nothing else. That's all the light he has. But it's it, it's <laughs> it's uh, very like, uh, but uh, how do you call it? Uh, it very goes into detail about the way he works and how he works. And he has like uh, the way he, they make crime look in his movie is the way they make like uh, going to like that like a blue collar. Uh, job at the shipyard, look. You know what I mean? They mean like they they make it very gritty. They may they don't like make it sexy or make it look like uh, oh how cool is this? They make it look very down to earth. And like especially in this, that opening scene of that movie, the first like ten minutes is just uh, no not much not no talking, and they just show them on a job and how they do the job and like the way they work. And it just looks so cool. Like it looks so cool because it it doesn't look. They tried so hard to make it not look cool. It's kind of insane to uh, to explain. But like, yeah, I really like that movie. It's just ah, uh, it's like it's one of my favorite Michael Mann movies. Like this is the the all those like eighties retro eighties stuff look like Thief and sounds like Thief. Like it has this uh, Tangerine Dream score in it, uh, and it has like this extremely like this is the first time like michael Bay just came out of the uh, out of the the, the the building swinging because like uh, the, 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 this this is the movie like every every scene is like between two, two and four uh, all the streets are just like wet like wet <laughs> pavements and everywhere is like neon lights and it's like oh this is the way i want a michael Bay movie to look and this is the way almost all like 80s retro type movies look so this is like a perfect uh, example of the way his style has influenced so many directors and so many other like uh, artists like years later like uh ah uh, shit what's that uh, the game i love so much uh, miami something something but i'm just can't think of it but uh 
uh, hotline hotline miami. miami yeah hotline miami like a lot of the hotline miami style uh, feels a lot like thief thief so yeah it's a very influential movie i think and it's really <laughs> like it's it's one of my favorite james Caan performances i really think uh, you guys should uh, try to find it and uh, check it out yeah sounds awesome um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I would like to see that definitely. Um, although I, w- I was thinking, you know, you were saying about the wet streets in LA and stuff with the neon lights and stuff. It rarely rains in LA. Sure. <laughs> Surely, I, Michael Mann should know that. I guess. Yeah, but it looks cool, and I think that's that is, is maybe a lot of the things that Michael Mann does is like because it looks cool. That's that's something you cr- criticize him for as well, because uh, yeah, he really tries to make things look cool. Yeah, he, he definitely does that. Um, yeah, Thief sounds awesome. I, I will try to uh, track that down. So let's move on to the uh, the next movie, uh, Manhunter, which was remade as Red Dragon uh, much later by Brett Ratner. I know everybody fucking hates Brett Ratner. But uh, yeah, w- Brack, you watched it just recently, right? So w- how, what was your take on Manhunter? It's, it's very interesting because like everybody else, I, I'm... I'm- I know the story already. I've seen the story in uh, in the TV show Hannibal, and of course, I know the character Hannibal from like the the, the other movies and uh, stuff like that. So it's weird to see it in this because in in the other later movies, uh, the Science of the Lambs, especially, like there's so much much mythology there. Uh, like that movie, it doesn't feel real. It feels like uh, like the prison in Science of the Lambs feels like Arkham. You know what I mean? <laughs> like and yeah. this is this manhunter feels like if you take that and it strip away all the super almost supernatural mythology based things around it, so it actually feels like really weird to watch it. Like it feels like watching uh, the real life story that inspired the Silence of the Lambs instead of watching an earlier earlier interpretation of it. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's the, how I felt watching. But I actually I really enjoyed the movie. Like it's really interesting to see that see it in that light and uh yeah it's just but i'm not in love with the movie like i really didn't really care that much about brian cox's uh interpretation of hannibal lecter like i feel like i say like uh the way anthony hopkins plays it it's almost like a mythologic 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 yeah like a mythology figure and brian cox plays it like an actual like a normal criminal and it's kind of weird to see that but uh, overall, it's a good movie. Yeah, I I've seen Manhunter. Um, I think I've seen it twice, in fact, uh, if memory serves. I don't remember anything uh, about the movie, to be honest. The only thing I really remember, and I think this speaks volumes about his performance, and I, I slightly disagree with you. I thought Brian Cox was great as Hannibal Lecter in the film, um, and because that's the only real image I have from Manhunter is just him in that like white brick cell. Um, behind the glass, uh, like in his, you know, his normal prison uniform, and I, I, I do agree with you. Uh, it is very different portrayal. It's a very down to earth, more realistic portrayal as, uh, of a normal person um, than Anthony Hopkins' portrayal in Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal and Red Dragon. But at the same time, you know, Anthony Hopkins is the fucking King Mac Daddy of serial killers. He's just awesome as Hannibal Lecter. So that, that I think no matter how good Manhunter is, it, it just has Anthony Hopkins just charisma and just awesomeness of his, of his character work in those films is looming over it like a shadow, you know, like when I watch Manhunter, it's just like, Oh, this is, this is decent, but like, damn, this Hannibal Lecter has nothing on Anthony Hopkins. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> like, like, like it feels like a real portrayal of actual, the actual criminal that inspired uh, uh, Hannibal Lecter instead of being Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, I, I guess so. You know what I mean? It's it's like um, like Anthony Hopkins. You know, is like like stage left saying, "I'm an actor." Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, on a on completely unrelated note, I fucking love the movie Hannibal. I know many people hate it, but man, I love that movie. But yeah, Manhunter was a was a. I, 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 don't, I don't care about Hannibal. Yeah, but yeah. You're 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 riding that Ridley Scott dick, so that's. I, I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm, 
And what we're doing Michael Mann here today, but uh, one day we're going to be there in Ridley Scott and we're going to get into this shit. But uh, yeah, yeah, Man yeah Hunter that, was yeah, a solid that, film. That's going to be when I finish uh, watching Robin Hood and it's still playing and I started like five years ago because that movie is way too long. <laughs> Man, if if man, if you if you think that's bad, you should watch what's it called, Exodus of Gods and Kings. Oh my God, I love Ridley Scott, man. That movie is bad. <laughs> oh my God, that's terrible. But uh, anyway, uh, Human Metal. Any any thoughts on Manhunter? Uh, have Not you seen really. it? No. Yeah, okay. oh, it's been ages. I've seen it like once and was uh, like. Coming straight out of Silent uh, uh, Silence of the Lambs and then going back and watching yeah. that, but uh, I don't know if I wasn't too uh, impressed with it or if it was just too different. I don't know, but it didn't really stay in my memory. Brack, what what do you think about uh, the what do you think about the remake of Manhunter compared to the original? What do you think? So Red Dragon is the remake of Manhunter. I don't care about Anthony Red Hopkins. Dragon either, but I, I, I don't really care about Red Dragon. Like, I, the only Anthony Hopkins Hannibal movie that I like is Sounds of the Lambs. Uh, besides yeah. that, I really like the interpretation of that storyline in the TV show Hannibal. That was pretty, uh, is really well done. Oh, they fun. got to that? Yeah, they definitely got to that. They got to Red Dragon. That's, that's that was the, an, it must have been in the third season because I know, haven't seen that. It's in the final season. They, they do yeah. the Red Dragon storyline and, yeah. and they do it really well. So, Okay. Oh man, I got, I got, I got, I got to watch me some Hannibal TV show. Definitely, I'm gonna definitely do that. Oh man, but I, I, I quite like Red Dragon. I love Hannibal. Um, I'm one of those weird people that likes Hannibal more than Signs of the Lambs. But there you go, my what, cinematic, cinematic guilty. I'm, I'm like a guilty of a crime against cinema. So I like, I like Hannibal more than Signs of the Lambs. I'll say it. <laughs> I like Hannibal the TV show more than Silence of the Lambs. I think. Yeah, I, I think I might as well, but I'm not sure if I like. I'm not sure if I like the uh, portrayal of of Hannibal more in uh, by Matt Mikkelsen than Anthony Hopkins, but I think I like the TV show more than the movies. But that's just me. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I haven't watched enough of the TV show to know, so I'm I'm, I'm out on that one. So let's uh, let's yeah continue. Let's yeah let's let's move away from Manhunter because I think it's eating up our time. And to be honest, we're talking more about Anthony Hopkins and those movies rather than we are talking about Manhunter. But uh, <laughs> uh, let's let's talk about uh, Heat. Yeah, so uh, the next movie, Heat. Um, yeah, goddamn, that's a good film. Uh, human <laughs> Mental, why, why don't we give you a chance to speak? Because you've been mute on the first two films. Oh, that's nice. Uh, I, you know, I just homework did homework for, for this podcast and watched three, or partly rewatched three Michael Mann movies, and Heat was one of them, which I haven't seen in like uh, 20 years, probably. How old is that movie? Does, it's does 90, that work out? 90, 90, 1994 or 5? Five. 5. Oh, there you go. 95. All right, so that works out. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's... I didn't remember anything from that movie, so that was a good idea. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, two of the greats, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, going head-to-head -head at their peak. What more do you have to say? And directed by Michael Mann, and it's a great crime story of, uh, you know, basically... A bunch of cops and a bunch of a uh, bunch of uh, pro thieves clashing with each other, or slowly like working their way towards each other. You know, uh, the the cops getting uh, slowly on the trail of the uh, uh, thieves and those having to deal with their own shit. And then it comes uh, to a clash at a certain point, and uh, you got this you got this great uh, dynamic between uh, Rod De Niro's character and uh, Neil was his name, I think, in the movie and. Uh, and Al Pacino's character, and uh, you know the way those two, you know they their attitude towards each other, and they, you know, you get you really get the feeling they respect each other, and and you know don't approve of what what the other does, obviously because they're on opposite side, the opposite side of the law. But in every moment they are together, you get the feeling hard. There's this mutual respect for what each other is capable of, and they're like, hey. It feels, I, it feels like the old west almost yeah it does do yeah exactly it's like i know man i don't if if my life would have gone the other way i might have i might stand where you are standing right now because we're kind of deep down we might be the same kind of people and that's why we maybe we have this connection and you know especially that that very scene at the end feels like very symbolic of that it's like yeah, damn. <laughs> Good uh, stuff. And I liked every scene with those two, especially. And, of course, there's this giant-ass 
a shootout in like the last third maybe of the movie or in the middle point and that's legendary i mean what can you say <laughs> yeah. about that it's just, it's also it's like another uh, michael matt staple which is like uh uh, uh, being at a diner in like two in the morning, you know? Oh yeah. Like there's yeah. just like the most dead seats in there in his movies are like at like a shitty drive-in diner. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> that's just... also, yeah. I mean, the heat is like it's the name heat is uh, works really well, and I mean that's that's probably intentional for the movie. I mean, it's also it's it's meant as like getting heat as a criminal, like feeling that someone is onto you and something like that and feeling something is, is a buzz and uh, might turn you. But also it's very reflective of the atmosphere that the movie exudes. Like that movie feels like it's very hot <laughs> and there's like, there's like, uh, you know, that's, that's like a bristling uh, street and I think it's set in LA too, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think Everything is set in LA. Way, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but you, you feel like the heat oozing from from the uh, from the TV screen when watching that movie too. Like, especially in those scenes with the diner and everything, even though they're like wearing full suits and everything, it feels like yeah, it just feels hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, even though those characters are cool, yeah, it's 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 a hot movie. It's a summer movie definitely. And uh yeah, it's just it's a, it's a cool movie. It's not my favorite, but it's it's up there. I really like it, and as like I said, I really like the dynamic between uh, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro's character a lot. I think it's uh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> what do you guys uh, guys think? It has like the one one of the it is probably has the two most iconic heist scenes in like history, right? Like mm-hmm. uh, there's the first one with like the the truck. Uh, with like the when it flip over the the the, the car, the truck car, yeah. that and that one, the bank. and then it's the bank heist. And like you know, I love uh, heat, but you know who loves heat way more than me? That's the, the guys. Auto? Yeah, <laughs> Grand Theft Auto. That's what I was about to what? say. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto <laughs> loves heat. <laughs> oh, Grand Theft Auto Four, like the best mission in Grand Theft Auto Four, is like an entire rip off of heat. And like both okay. of the best missions from Grand Theft Auto Five are also just rip offs of heat of heat. Like the entirety of Grand Theft Auto Five is like a love letter to Michael Mann in general, but uh, especially to Hit. Yeah. So yeah, that's um, it. I, I love playing those scenes because it's like, oh yeah, this is what it feels like to be in a Michael Mann movie, and it's pretty cool. I yeah, yeah. I think uh, what's his name, Michael from Grand Theft Auto Five, is like pure Michael Mann. Like yeah. Um. So. I won't beat around the bush. Heat is one of my favorite films of all time. If I had to compile a list of my top 10 films of all time, there's no question that he would be on it. I love that film. I've seen it many, many times. I was lucky to see it when I was like 14 years old or whatever in the cinema. Um, Blew me away then. I'd never seen anything like that. Um, I wasn't even old enough to see it, to be honest, because it was 15 rated and I was 14. But still, I saw it in the cinema. Um, I thought it was amazing when I saw it in the cinema because mostly because of its, you know, its visceral sort of violent action scenes. I mean, that that gunfight in the middle of the movie is is p- p- quite possibly the best gunfight ever ever committed to, to God, cinema. Gun sounds in Michael Mann movies are like <laughs> like a step above every other gun sounds. Like like his gun, the guns in his movies always yeah. sounds like oh this is what a guru gun sounds like and it's loud as fuck. Like it's yeah. Like, <laughs> It's really like like a, a shock across the arm, like a slap in the face, because he always has the gun sounds and always has like the sequences where it's like real silent before him, like no sound, no background yeah. sound, nothing. And then the gun sounds go off and it's like way louder than you think it's going to be. And you remember, oh, it's going to be loud, but it's always a little bit louder than you remember. It's, 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 yeah, that's it's, problematic when you watch the movie at like... 10 p.m. at night and have like all the windows open and you completely forget about that and then there's like and then it comes the scene with the giant ass shooter and you're like oh fuck oh fuck <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry neighbors it oh, I, well I, I love that like um I loved that in the cinema I was blown away by that when I saw it when I was 14 the fact that that gunfire was just about 20 times louder than anything else in the film. It was brilliant when you watched it in the cinema. It was like, man, it really feels like you're like standing there on the street watching this shit. It's like, oh, I it was such a brilliant film. But this is what I love about Heat. Um, that film has evolved uh, or has changed for me as the years have gone on. So I've seen, I've probably seen that film way more times than 
you two have, uh, to be fair, because it is one of my favorite films of all time, and I, I watch it pretty much every year. At I've some seen point. it twice, so <laughs> yeah. Well, I've definitely, I've, I mean, I've seen it like 15, 20 times yeah. or something. So, but like, uh, but as through the years, at the of course, at what blows you away first, the action scenes and the cool stuff. But like, as I got older, the drama really started to, to proper nail me. And like now that film's a fucking tearjerker for me. Like, and it's not just like the major moments where like, uh, you know, Al Pacino finds his daughter, like, you know, with a wrist cut or whatever in the bath. Yeah. I'm a father now. So that, that fucks me. Um, but also it's like, some of the minor scenes, but really poignant as you get older, like the black guy where he, you know, he's having a tough time after um, getting out of prison and he gets like taken advantage of by his his boss who, you know, is like taking a portion of his money, basically extorting him. And the guy's just trying to hang on and make a decent living. And there's a scene where they're in the bar and he's talking to his wife and his or his girlfriend or whatever and she's saying i'm proud of you and he's like what are you proud of me for it's like man it crushes me like when i see that it's like a proper can can't hold back those man tears there um it's also, so it's, it's also one of those uh, uh one of apparently one of the staples in michael mann movies at least i've seen it in two movies where there's a character introduced that you expect to have a much more significant role and then he just gets like off violently in 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 one scene yes he's basically just coming into the story to have like gruesome death or like you know you, be that character you want to get out of there safely and then he just gets you know nailed by fucking cannon fire so, yeah yeah <laughs> I, I i i can definitely see that yeah that that that, that 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 definitely happens um you wait until you see black hat son fuck me <laughs> um but uh also, uh, one one last rejoinder um, that I'll, I'll throw in there, which was hilarious, I think, is that uh, I saw an interview with uh, Al Pacino recently, and he was saying, so Al Pacino's performance is amazing in that film, as is Robert De Niro's, but... He's got um, a great ass! That's yeah, like one of you those legendary quotes that you've heard. All the way up it! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. Legendary. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I like the one... He's got so many good quotes, like, who, who, what are you, a fucking owl? <laughs> but I interrupted you, you wanted to tell a story about uh, but, what he yeah. said. So his performance is amazing, he's, he's electric in that film, he's just so energetic, but I read an interview with him where he was saying, actually, when he went into that film, he just decided to play the character as if he was high on cocaine. Like every time, <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> like he specifically did it because he was he was saying he was thinking basically, how can a guy be that wired, that on edge all the time? So he's just playing it as if you know, like basically for him, he was like the character's like <laughs> constantly on two <laughs> all the time to be wired up to the max. And when you watch Heat back with that in mind, that he's playing that character <laughs> like like whacked up on two, it becomes quite funny as well. <laughs> Don't yeah. waste my motherfucking time. <laughs> but like it, it's also kind of uh, interesting to see that like it's the cop that's like on edge the, the cop is the is the crazy one yeah normally it's like yeah. the criminal is the crazy one but the the car and, and it, like the the, the 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 cop is like the straight and arrow but like here robert the Nero is like the professional you know what i mean he's oh, yeah. like the he's down stone to, cold the stone cold down to earth professional and he's just doing his job that's what they, that's the like the, the way he goes right like i'm just doing my job this is the only thing i could do this is the only thing the way i can make money i'm just i'm just this is like a job for him but like al pacino is the crazy one and it's kind of interesting to see that I, I, a couple i got two more things because i love this movie so much and i'm, I'm probably not going to be able to talk about it much on the podcast anymore but um, i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna pay particular note to two specific things in the film um one is the dynamic where the hero his life fucking dive bombs and crashes in the film yeah it just takes a nosedive you know his his uh, stepdaughter tries to commit suicide he basically ends up getting divorced during the film um all all kinds of hell breaks loose for him yet the bad guy has the opposite arc his life is improving dramatically right he falls in love has the notion to escape and get away so it's really fantastic like gray dynamic where you see the hero's personal life car crash and you see the the bad guy i guess you know in quotes the bad guy's life blossom 
so there's that fantastically mixed feeling at the end you know you kind of want to get you want to see the bad guy get away but at the same time you also don't want to see the good guy lose because he's the good guy right so yeah. it's it's a fantastic convoluted dynamic also i will yeah you met you got you got something to say uh i also like there's like this connection between the, i mean i already said that there's a connection between them but especially at the end where you like where they basically put these both scenes like back to back where you see that both characters are thinking about jumping over their shadow trying to do things different for a change like letting it go and they can't both of them can't because they're destined to you know coll collide at the end yeah but yeah. it's it's understandable it's very relatable it's like yeah of course the way that character has acted so far and the character like he wouldn't be able to let this go it's just the way it is right and i mean it's you see they want to they want to jump yeah. over the shadow but they just can't that that's that that's a perfect segue because the other thing i wanted to bring up is a moment of supremely brilliant acting that just impresses me every time i see it the scene where robert de niro is driving in his car and mm -hmm. yeah that's he's the one going i'm talking about He's going to the airport and he's going through a tunnel and nothing is said. He doesn't say anything, but you can just see his torment on his face. He's thinking about what to do. And even though he's not saying anything, you can see precisely from his performance exactly what he's thinking when he's weighing up his decision. Does he go to the airport or does he go to kill Wayne Grow? Like you can see it. And then that moment, you just see his, that smile appear on his face. You can see he's thinking about his girlfriend and then it disappears. And he has everything at this point. He has, he has a safe route out. He has his girlfriend with him, which, yeah. you know, might have, wasn't even a surefire bet that she would go with him, but he turned that around. And the only thing he has to do is like, let things be things. Hope that Van Gogh yeah. gets up by the police or something like that. He just can't do it. He can't, can't fucking do it. Do it. And, that, <laughs> and that's a that, downfall. And that moment when you see his face change, just that expression yeah. change, and he just wrenches the wheel to the right. It's just like, damn, yeah. that's fantastic acting right there. You're like, it's... that's it? That's it for you? <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah. No, it's good stuff. I uh, feel The only criticism like I have about this movie, I guess, is that the... Uh, f but that's, that's uh, maybe a, um, a sign of the times or something. And, you know, Michael Mann's directing style. We talked about the hyper-masculinity that the uh, ladies in this movie get a bit of the short stick when in terms of variety, they're all like the girlfriend, the wife. Of course, there's their facets to them. Like, they're not like simple characters but they're always kind of in the same role as of like they're uh you know they are n not necessarily problematic for us or a complication in the character's life because you know uh amy brendan's character is a positive force uh, in De Niro's uh life but it's still it feels like okay there is there is not a woman in this with real agency and that's that's maybe a bit of a, a problematic thing but like i said that's maybe you know that when the movie was made that wasn't that common either so i don't know yeah i, I don't know i never thought about that i think they just generally feel nice i mean the black guy's girlfriend wife is is obviously a massive support to that guy and sure. is wonderful and is uh, also the the val kilmer's wife isn't just a, a showpiece i mean she i wasn't saying they're a showpiece that's not what i mean i'm saying like they don't really have their own stories aside from being related what? in some well, way to those characters um... Well, but yeah, but then again, how many how many female armed robbers are running around even today? Not that many, to be honest. There's actually a real cool uh, female robbers uh, movie coming out uh, this year that like looks cool. amazing. Like uh, it's from like the that, director that, that also did Twelve Years a Slave, a shame. Which, but I'm, I'm gonna show you the trailer later. But like <laughs> that movie looks amazing. But uh, uh, like Michael Bed, definitely his goal is exp exploring like masculinity in a way. So mm. it makes sense that that like the, his it's definitely obvious that his focus isn't on the female characters. Like you can't like argue that at all. Like they, those characters are, are weak and are there and not weak as a character, but like they're not that uh, three-dimensional and they're they're more to explore the masculinity of those 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 male characters. They're more to explore those male characters than they are there to be uh, a part of the story. To, it gets to, better to, over to be, t t time. Yeah, I mean, there's another movie like can bring it up now that we're going to talk later with in in detail like my yeah. Miami Vice gets Miami Vice, better yes. in that regard but I was gonna still that. you know just it of course that or 
you know, that whole thing sticks out more when you look at all the movies that are coming out that have uh, uh, women as main characters and there are specifically stories geared towards that uh, a female audience and stuff like that, but still venture in the same uh, ballpark, uh, you know, action cinema and everything that that movie does. And this is just so traditional and different and so focused on the other characters. I'm not saying that's necess that's necessarily a bad thing. It just feels like uh, so so different from what we're getting today that it just you know that it jumped out at me and that's what i'm talking about mm. i i to be honest i i would disagree i think the women were fine in that film i think it's a oh, like you said i think I it's mean, a fair reputation of the of the age it was made in and also a, a yeah. fair reputation of women in general i mean uh like i say there aren't that many badass i mean sure you could have a couple of female police officers that that wouldn't go amiss maybe but uh, you don't have that many you know professional badass armed robbers running around who uh yeah you know, i said it's 80s of the time considering the time the mm. movie that made uh, one that was probably a favorable reverse uh, mm. representation of the situation common sense time yeah sure it's just like it jumped out at me because it's different today i mean that's a good thing i guess you know that it's yeah. different today but it just felt like all right we're I guess we're not getting those kind of stories or with that kind of character related anymore where those where the female characters are just the wife or the girlfriend with depth to them, but still just Hugh, the wife and the girlfriend. See, that, see human metal is very progressive. He uh, He's going to be in the situation where, you know, some woman comes to him, pulls a nine on him and, you know, says to him, give me your fucking wallet. Like some girl says, so give me your fucking wallet now. I'm going to blow you away. And he's going to take out his wallet and say, good for you. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're taking uh, the wrong things from my statements. But <laughs> that's fine. It's like finally some good representation in uh, uh, street side robbery. street crime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, equal, I would punch that boss face in. But crime. Still, <laughs> I mean, if you pull a gun on me, I'm probably going to die. But uh, still, I would, I would uh, try to defend myself, whether it's a man or a woman. I don't give a shit. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Exactly. If, well, if she does, I would if try she to break her neck. I would lose, karate, but still. Or she comes at him with a bottle, then... Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> fucked, yeah. Woman. Weapon! Yeah. Um, uh, if so, you're an uh, asshole to me, uh, you are risking to getting punched. Uh, doesn't matter what your gender is, so... There you go. He's a... He's Equal a, rights. He, he's, a, he's a... Really into his sexual quality. Doesn't matter, he's gonna punch you anyway. I said, yes. you know, we're talking about men beating their wife. What about sex? <laughs> God damn it. It's all about sexual equality, women. I'm just giving you the same as I give anyone else. Should we get to the next movie? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Talk about the beating stuff. Ali, right? Or what? <laughs> oh, the insider Brack. I don't, I don't, is next. I haven't seen that movie. Wow, I have, so fuck you. Um, yeah, so The Insider is one of the most boring films that you can ever possibly watch. It has nothing to recommend about it, even though it has two acting heavyweights in Russell Crowe and, uh, and Al Pacino. I sat for two and a half hours or whatever the fuck it was, and I hated it. I thought it was the most boring thing ever. Then many years later, I thought, wait, I may have misjudged this movie. So I went back. And I watched it again, and it was the most boring thing I've ever seen again. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm done with that film. Next. Yeah, okay. yeah I mean, it's interesting because this is like either. this is like one of his most critically acclaimed movies, right? Yeah, like I know. That's why I thought I thought yeah. I must be missing something. I think because of the subject is a bit more interest. Uh, interesting is the wrong word, but more deep in qu quote unquote than uh, his other movies are. Those yeah. other movies are fun, um, or maybe fun, uh, realistic action action movies, and this is more like politically uh, charged. So yeah, it's I kind of weird that's that why like, got more acclaim. His, his critical acclaim is mostly for movies that I like. I don't think of his has his movies. Like uh, yeah, there's this movie <laughs> and the next movie we're gonna talk about is Ali. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that got like Oscar nominations as well. And to it, be fair, it, I didn't even know that he made Ali, so... <laughs> that's what I mean. It feels very yeah. like a traditional, like, uh, biopic. Uh, yeah. And I don't really feel his style in it. Yeah. No, masculinity, though. Because that's yeah, that, Ali for you. That's obvious, but... Yeah. yeah. Uh, it feels like a biopic. It doesn't feel really like... Like, uh, like it, definitely it's about masculinity, but it's not like an exploration of masculinity, which is what no. other movies No, no, it's, it's, it's a legit biopic. That's, uh. Yeah. 
I got got that feeling too when I watched that once. But in, and a lot of that, I mean, are we are we talking about Ali already? Yeah, I we're, guess we're, we're done with the insider. Yeah. <laughs> that was fast. Anyway, uh, yeah, a lot of Ali, I mean, comes down to just Will Smith hogging that performance. Obviously, that that movie is solely focused on him, and I don't know how much man as a director had even uh, a chance to implement like his own sensibilities and style that i mean the director always has of course but like it's will smith going all out trying to like inhabit that character right, and... this is this is will smith like i want my oscar really yeah please, yeah definitely please give me an oscar and that's what the focus on what you pay attention to when you watch that movie so uh i won't be ready for for not noticing this is uh, uh, as a, a michael mann movie either way so <laughs> Yeah, it's a very different thing. Is it but good, though? You... Yeah, that's a question. Uh, I Like I said, I've only seen it once. It's been a while, so I don't know. I, I, don't don't even, re- I, don't... I can't even tell if it was good. Like, I don't remember if it was yeah. good. I don't remember it. I, I can't tell either. <laughs> Chuchu, what did you think? I've never seen it, so... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a problem. I don't so... think we'll get a consensus here. It might be good. Um, it might not be. I think it was uh, a good it's... performance by... by yeah. uh... Yeah, it's not it's performance by Will Smith, but I don't think if he, him, he was even the best person to cast in that role. Like, like, I th- yeah, I think that what, if I remember correctly, I hope I'm not like, uh, I'm not uh, like recalling my my memory badly here. But I think that st- thing that stuck out to me uh, is that the movie felt a bit fragmented in terms of a story structure, and that might happen with biopic because I think that movie is pretty long, and you if. You don't have to be it even longer. You have to jump to the important stations like uh, in Ali's life that everyone expects to see. And I guess, if I remember correctly, I wasn't too impressed with the way that that movie handled that. It felt like, okay, we're jumping to this now, and we're jumping to this now, and we're jumping to this now. And it didn't feel like this very, I don't know, fluent and connected line through the movie. Yeah, but I think you're right. Like It tries to focus on like a 10-year uh, time period, right? Mm. It's, a, it's not focused on like one big fight or something or like the period around one big fight it really tries to focus on like a huge part of his life so yeah. it, it really feels a little bit like too bit thinly spread out yeah yeah i i think i think i i figured out a way to describe the insider especially the brack because he's seen the film um I uh no, 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 no. Uh, you've seen the film I'm going to reference, Brack. So basically, I can tell you what The Insider is like so you never have to suffer through it. The Insider is like Black Hat with all the action scenes removed. Ooh. Yeah. It's it's not fun. Um, <laughs> we got to get to Black Hat. To a, but... let's, let's, let's move on to a movie that is very, 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 very fucking fun, and that is Collateral. Can hmm. I talk about that, please? Yes, okay, Human Metal, go for it. Because... Just for how Chuchu is with Heat, Collateral is one of my favorite movies of all time. So, uh, which I did, I didn't pay attention to. Like, oh, this is from the guy who made Heat and everything. And at that point, it would have been a while since I've seen it's Heat. So, I wouldn't necessarily have, you know, gone into that movie with any expectations. But I heard like, hey, this is a Tom Cruise thing, and the story sounded interesting. And I was like, okay, let's check this out. And it was just fucking blown away by this movie i love this movie so much and i rewatched it yesterday after seeing my miami vice uh so it was a double dip there but man that movie is so fucking great i love everything about it i love how the immediately like the movie from the get-go it immediately endears you to the characters that you need to be endeared to which is uh any aj Finkin smith character and uh, uh max's character like they immediately like oh i get what these characters are about i get where they're coming from and what their problems and what their deal is and why they connect to each other and why they like each other and everything it's just a small scene at the beginning that is still like in the evening hours and then we're getting into the night because then tom cruise the uh you know the professional hitman enters uh jamie fox's max's car and then we get like this fucking ride, uh, uh, ride through uh, the night, uh, LA nighttime and this tour de force for these, char- for these characters and, you know, Max getting pulled into this, like, fucking life uh, of, of crime and death and everything and, like, being completely overwhelmed by it in the beginning and then slowly, slowly progressing in the character. And I just... Ah! 
I fucking love the dynamic between <laughs> Tom Cruise character Vincent and Max in this movie so much. The way they clash with each other, the way they like recognize things they kind of like about each other, help out, each other out a bit, you know, each for their own benefit, but still the the scene where vincent like uh is like why do you let your superior talk to uh, to you that way he's fucking up don't do that and he co calls the superior and says tell him he's a he's a fat piece of shit and like i love that scene so much <laughs> and uh yeah and the way they call each other out on their shit like every vincent is like this completely nihilistic asshole who's like ah oh, nothing like this matters who cares of if people die did you care about rwanda rwanda and shit and uh later max is like yeah right you're full of shit too like you're you're saying all that but you don't necessarily mean that you're just a sociopath and i don't have to listen to anything you're saying and i just what well, there's, mm. there's also the yeah. scene where um fantastically uh tom cruise calls jamie shit uh jamie fox on his bullshit he's he calls yeah, max on his exactly. bullshit where he's like saying you know you know you're just saying you have these dreams but they're just like pipe dreams and yeah you, you have you know in the back dream... of your mind you know they're pipe dreams you have been driving a taxi for 12 years that's not someone who is actually gonna you're not actually gonna do what you plan to do you have already settled for yeah. escaping to your little f fantasy island for five minutes each hour or something and that's your life now and that's gonna be your life and you're not gonna change anything because you know you're too scared that it's not gonna be perfect and that's so true and max knows yeah. it's true and that's that the really point that actually turns <laughs> that pisses him off that's the point that turns him around right it's like okay yeah that's why but why is are you the one telling me that like why do i have to be told that by a fucking asshole and sociopath and yeah i'm still better than you i can turn this around and that actually that's actually the point where he like finally decides to take i mean he takes action before this when he destroys the stuff uh you know the the information from uh vincent and everything but that doesn't work out for him perfectly but yeah so many great movie, moments in this movie and i just love 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 the character dynamic between tom cruise and jamie fox in this they're both fantastically displaying their characters and uh i think that talk about perfect casting i think tom cruise i don't know if you guys agree with me but tom cruise is always slightly off like in real <laughs> life and everything he is kind of i don't know every time that guy smiles i feel like yeah <laughs> that that's like lizard man is smiling under that mask and so he's perfect for this role of vincent because of course vincent is like this psycho kind of and he's you know, he's well-spoken, he's nice, he's intelligent, he's very professional and everything, but you feel this coldness beside him, and you feel every time he smiles, there's something incredibly off about it. Because, of course, it is. It makes total sense. And so, Tom Cruise is perfect for this. <laughs> it's like this, this is also the last time I think Tom Cruise acted, you know, like where he's playing yeah. something <laughs> that's, that's not just Tom Cruise. Well, he's not phoning it in with Mission Impossible, no, but, no, no, it, know, but he's still playing just Tom Cruise, you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, that's true. I, I, I think uh, uh, Tom Cruise, especially during his sort of re SF, like sci science fiction renaissance, is, is pretty good. And I do like Tom Cruise. Yeah. However, I, like Tom Cruise I, too. I personally think uh, Collateral is his best performance that he's ever oh, put in, in his career. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, Damn. But yeah, I just, I love this movie. I, I haven't, hadn't seen it in a while. I was like, oh man, I wonder, is that... Is that movie still gonna hold up when I see it? Is it like is it gonna disappoint me in some way because I look at some certain things crit more critical now? No, <laughs> that movie's perfect to me. Like definitely, like from beginning to end. Like the way that movie ends with the shot and uh, of of the of the tram uh, of the subway train going out and Tom Cruise sitting there, like singing together in the uh, on the seat. It's fantastic. It's everything about this movie. Uh, the visuals are fantastic. The music is fantastic. Like the one scene where they're in the car and then there's like a pack of coyotes or wolves coyotes, running across the yeah. street. Yeah, yeah, that's one that of scene. the mad. That's one of those magic movie moments that yeah. will always stick with me. That will always be in my memory. It, when the music hits and that happens, and both these characters, you know, at, put together in the, at this point in their lives, but coming from completely different angles, just looking at these animals and feeling like. You know, it's just ah, it's amazing. Also, Everything what, works in this movie. Like I, I don't really have anything to add that you haven't said, but I find it's also an example of uh, the way Michael Mad movies just like a weird like influence of video games because I've seen that nightclub sequence like in, oh like, that's also so fantastic. It's like an amazing sequence, yeah. and I've seen that like uh, uh, like referenced and like 
reused or repurposed in like a lot of video games. Like in like mm. uh, the le- uh, the last uh, Max Payne game has like a couple sequences that are just exactly like this Michael Mann uh, 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 nightclub sequence, and there's some other uh, games as well. Like Michael Mann for some reason has like a weird influence on uh, video games as well. Yeah, I I um. I have a couple of things to add. Uh, so Heat is my favorite Michael Mann film, I think, and one of my favorite films of all time. But like Human Metal, also Collateral is not far off. It's 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 chasing Heat's tail. It's you know, that would be in like my top thirty films probably. It's it's brilliant. I love it. I love it so much. Um, uh, so a couple of things that I would say. I love the way, like Human Metal said. Those characters, they really get under each other's skin. It's a yeah. really fantastic dynamic, and like you know, when they're when they're just chatting or you know when they're they're discussing things or arguing, it's just electric. It's brilliant. Um, I'll, I'll, there are a couple of scenes that I'll just point out, which I just think are brilliant. That moment in where Vincent sends uh uh max oh, max yeah max into the club to get the oh, yeah. retrieve the data and he has to he has to act he has to yeah. switch into assassin mode um you know or pretend to be an assassin there's that brilliant mode where it where the, the the bad guys are just thinking you know like like something's something's off with this guy and like yeah. and he has to do that moment it's just like tell that guy behind me to you know, take his hand off his gun or I'm going to beat his bitchy ass to death with it. It's just <laughs> so badass and cool. It's just awesome. Yeah. An awesome moment. I also loved the way that Mark uh, Ruffalo in the film, you know, the cop who who yeah. seems like he's going to be the cavalry. I love the way, spoiler alert, I love the way he gets killed in that film. Like That's he just, what I like, mean. Like, it's like it's, the black guy in Heat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 that's the thing. It, but the thing is, it's better than that because it's it's exactly the ethos that Vincent is talking about. It doesn't matter. A speck of dust, yeah. and we're all gone. Like yeah. it's like life is nothing, and like you know, for us as the audience, you know, you're like, oh damn. But for him, it's just like another day in the office for Vincent. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean, he that's doesn't. He that's it. Doesn't he? Doesn't even blink. Like, and and I think that just like that's connected with the narrative of the film. Unlike the black guy in Heat, who just, you know, and should he have is also, You know, he's like, th- th- that's the inciting moment, I guess, before things go totally awry for Vincent. Uh, but th- that's the first thing that, that Jamie Foxx says, you didn't have to kill him, he tried to save me. And uh, that's what Max says. And Vincent says, oh, so I, didn't, I sh- shouldn't have shot him because he tried to save you. That's the only reason, right? Because otherwise he wouldn't have cared about that, that person and that character. But he believed you and he wanted to get you out of them. That's the only reason why you even give a damn. And that's yeah. maybe partially also true. And that's why it gets Max even more angry or starts to get him angry. And yeah, there's so much cool stuff in this, uh, in this movie like that. And yeah, it's, it's great. It's, I, I think the, the reason I like it more than Heat is because, um, you know, we talked about the character that made, because it's even an even more intimate movie than Heat. You got this intimate, uh, you know, intimate connection between Al Pacino's character and Robert De Niro's character in Heat. But it's got a bigger cast, and you know there, are, you know there are different plot lines that the movie jumps around between those a bit, which I also like. But I like the more intimate feel of Collateral more. So, and that it's all playing during nighttime. Uh, you know, it's it's just one night. That's also very cool. Just in terms uh, in terms of time and progression in this movie, it starts with uh, in the evening hours and ends in the morning hours of the next day. It's just one night, uh, one crazy night for that one character or those two, two, three characters. And that's it's that's what the focus is on, and it just feels like this perfect little movie that I, I really love. So I also love some of the like I was saying about the uh, one the last thing I'll say about this film. The, I was saying about the, how when the cop gets killed, Fanning. See, I, I know that movie so well I can remember his name, Fanning. When Fanning gets killed, when the cop gets killed, it's not just a shock death. It's like it's related to Vincent's like. Uh, like philosophy about life and death as well. The way that it doesn't matter who you are, just bang, you can just go like that, no matter how important you seem. Um, so I think that's like connected to the narrative. But one thing that always really impressed me was a quote that comes early in the film, where Vincent is uh, being asked if he likes LA, if he likes the city, mm-hmm. and he's saying, "No, I hate it here. It's all spread out and disconnected." 
nobody knows each other. Like, mm-hmm. I think that's, that's you know, his opinion of the city, but do you know what I mean? It's like connected to his general philosophy and just his kind of like isolation away from everybody. It's like little mm-hmm. things like that about that film. When you, like little nuggets when you, when you go back and watch it. Um, just, just great character writing in that movie. Yeah, just really, really fantastically detailed, very clever, very cerebral uh, script writing there. So just fantastic. Yeah. So All right. agreed. From this movie, we go on to uh, sort Miami of guilty, Vice. Sort of a guilty pleasure of mine. I actually kind of like Miami Vice, but <laughs> yeah, then maybe you should. Uh, uh, should I talk about it because I don't really yes, remember? No. Like I don't really remember anything from it except we'll the, correct you on uh, obvious except mistakes. Except kind of liking it. That's like it. That's that's all I remember from it. I remember it's like oh yeah, this is a pretty. This I feel like Miami Vice is all style and no substance. Substance. But the style is pretty fucking cool. <laughs> That's all I remember from Miami Vice, in my opinion. Say it's not all style. It, there's a bit of substance, substance there, but I would agree not that much. <laughs> I see. Pretty... I, I kind of like the characters. Like I actually kind of like Colin Farrell in it. Like Colin Farrell goes for it in this movie, especially yeah. in his hairstyle. And his story <laughs> is the most interesting one. Like Sonny Crockett's story, uh, you know, and his relationship to. Uh, Gong Li's character or Li Gong? What, what was her name in the uh, in the movie? Actually, hmm? I don't know. Her name is Gong Li, the actress. Yeah. but I don't know. Uh, I've forgotten her name. In, yeah, in but you know, their their relationship is the most interesting thing about that movie, in my opinion. Like, I, how far you know do they really feel something for each other? How far are they willing to go for each other and stuff like that? And what's the most interesting aspect but for I, me? I, I find it funny that like, oh, it's obvious that like behind the scenes that that Jamie Fox is like, okay, make me look cool. But like Colin, yeah. Colin Farrell is like, yeah, give me that mullet and that mustache and those big, suits <laughs> that are like five sizes too big because that's how yeah. my fives look like. So yeah, that, yeah. That, that I kind of like I respect that decision. But let's talk about the look. And I think the movie got a, I wouldn't say call it backlash, but a lot of people didn't like it. Mm. And I feel like maybe the reason for that was, among other things, uh, it being maybe a bit too dark not only in terms of tone but also in terms of visuals when compared to the old series i I guess a lot more people expected maybe maybe a brighter thing but this is like a very dark interpretation of the miami vice quote quote unquote universe and uh you know it's of course that makes speaks more to the sensibilities of michael mann as a director but maybe that wasn't what people expected from like the big uh screen debut of that thing so i oh, wonder if that also wasn't also reason. digital cameras like this is in the time yeah. period that digital cameras weren't perfect yet like where it's like oh yeah that nowadays but but all by almost all movies are shot digitally and, uh, and all movies look and those movies look great but in yeah. 2006 very grainy yeah yeah oh yeah this collateral movie. too i rewatched it the scenes that are in in complete darkness they don't look that good yeah, no, <laughs> it's very grainy it's very grainy like this is definitely yeah. not like the, like he really wanted to be on the edge of like the technology, and he was, but it wasn't working just yet, especially not with his visual sensibility. So it looks like sometimes it looks pretty off-putting. Mm. I, it, it looks sometimes it looks like f- finding a videotape in the attic. You're like oh, <laughs> and there are other scenes that look fantastic. Yes, so it's yes. like you know the, the daytime scenes always look really good, there, but you know once we get into night, it's you know. Don't look at those shadows too hard, especially uh, in the uh, action scenes. There's those scenes, like like some, some speedboat scenes look amazing. Like there's like mm-hmm. amazing speedboat sequence. And like, oh yeah, this looks gorgeous. And then you go to a yeah. night sequence. It's like, oh, this this does do, looks like it filmed from like a dash camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, I, I quite like that about the film, that, that dash camera thing. It feels like you're there sort of in the thick of the action. You know what I mean? Like one of those cop shows on TV. I, I, I always kind of like that about the film so sure, I, but it's, that... it's it's become obvious as as we're speaking that i like miami vice way more than you two i fucking love miami vice <laughs> like that's one of those films that mystifies i me. liked it too i didn't love it but i like oh, no, it it's obvious that yeah, you I like it, it more like i i, I yeah. think it's uh, a bit underrated and maybe a bit shit, shit on too much but I think yeah it's that's really... true i think i after watching it for the first time yesterday i didn't really get like the the hate that i read for it and yeah. certain reviews and it's like this is a fine movie it's definitely not michael mann's best not by long shot but uh but it's still a decent movie it's, so <laughs> it's it's not as good as heat or collateral don't get me wrong no. but i i think for me it's third place amongst the rest okay. of your stuff but um 
like but i just really really love that film i really 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 like it and it's one of those films that mystifies me it's like i just don't know why people don't like it i watch it and i'm like damn this is awesome and i just i you know there are some movies that are guilty pleasures and you recognize you know like like damn this movie's a bit shit but i like it anyway for x y and z yeah. but uh this is one of those films that i watched it and it's just like how how can people just not like this like, i just don't know like I was saying at the beginning, it maybe comes down to expectation and what people who, uh, especially people who watch the old TV show, expected this movie to be, even after reading that Michael Mann was directing it. And I still feel that movie, that movie is vastly different from the old TV show in terms of like everything, how the characters behave, how uh, you know it's filmed, uh, the way it looks, like <laughs> tone, everything. Like this is go, this is o Miami Vice movie only in uh you know with the names of the character and the setting and maybe that's the problem i, I, I don't think really care about the, my part, TV part, show. Part of, yeah that, maybe that's why you like the movie so much part of the so. backlash also is i think this is like uh, on the downhill of, of colin farrell uh popularity yeah like, maybe this was like this was right before he, ha he like completely reinvented himself as like more of an indie actor with in bruges and stuff like that uh so people were like pretty down on Miami on, on, mm. on Colin Farrell in general, and his 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 uh, I know his, I really like Colin Farrell in this movie. Actually, I think he's like I probably do. the best yeah. part of this movie. And I, yeah, definitely. I just, great. I, I just like yeah. the choice he goes for. But he was he's more interesting than Jamie Foxx's character because uh, honestly, like uh, Taps doesn't get that much interesting to do in that movie. He Oh, uh, well, no, he doesn't. His but he does. With, he his... does have one fucking great moment in the film, though, that I love. Yes, so, I think he's several uh, great moments, but most of them are together when he's together with uh, yeah. uh, with Colin Farrell on the screen. Well, well Colin Farrell is that... definitely the lead in the film. He's yeah. definitely the main yeah, yeah character. definitely, and I, and that's what I uh, th that's made me my gripe with the movie. I expected more of a team dynamic from this because you know it's that two-man team that you know from that series and I expected okay this is maybe going to be a buddy cop thing but more serious but the focus is going to be of the stories of these two characters and the focus was definitely on Sonny Crocker slash Carl Farrell's character and that was cool too because this story was the most interesting but I feel like you know maybe that was also a thing people expected more from this movie that they didn't get that we would get maybe a bit more a uh, Ricardo Tapp story which you know Unless it was connected to the scenes with uh, with uh, Colin Farrell, that didn't really happen that much. So, so I, I I will I will um, it seems I, I I love this film more than you guys. I think I, I will uh, uh, tell us why. <laughs> focus on a couple of things, like three things yeah. in specific that I really fucking loved about that film. Three specific things. Firstly, um, the gunfight at the end of the film. The gunfight uh, that they have at the end where they, you know, like they have a hostage or whatever and, um, uh, no, they, 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 aren't they doing, yeah, they have, they kind of have a, they have a hostage, right? Yeah, the, the girl's the, that's right, the Gong Li's the hostage and they yeah. have like a trade-off. That gunfight is awesome. I think my, that just reinforces Michael Mann just being the master of a gunfight. Like that, that gunfight, as you say, it's like quite grainy because it's at night and it looks like it's like film from like it like you say like a like a dashboard camera or something but i think that adds to the charm that kind of in the thick of it feeling because you can't really see things well at night and I, I really like that sort of realistic aspect of that final gunfight so i think that gunfight is just wicked cool it's awesome um uh also i love one of my favorite scenes in the film which i absolutely love is where tubs and crockett are in a hangar and they're about to go on the final, um, maybe rescue mission or something. No, no, the, the, maybe the final boat drop or something. I've forgotten what they're doing. But like, so they don't get much character time. Like most of the scenes, if you notice, Croc, uh, Tubbs and Crockett, they they, uh, they don't talk to each other very much in the film. I noticed. Yeah, <laughs> but they, 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 they have they have that. Uh, 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 uh silent understanding you know yes <laughs> that's, yeah. that's so part, yeah, much part of like like my michael man's movies as well you know that silent you get the feel between two two equals you know what i mean you get yeah. the feeling that they have been working together for a long time and know what yeah, each yeah, yeah. other thinks at any time any moment and so. that's the the peak scene is that scene in the hangar where you know 
finally, you know, you've been wondering throughout the movie whether, you know, what Jamie Foxx's, like, reaction is to him getting involved with this girl. And then finally, Jamie Foxx is finally like, you know, like, you know, you know, well, you know uh, I will never doubt you, he says to him, I think. But, uh, you know, I will never doubt you. I will never question you. But, you know, are you sure this is exactly what you want to do with this girl like this? And then, you know, Croc is telling him, you know, you know, I'm all about this girl. Like, it's like really meaningful to me. That's the only thing that they need to say to each other about that situation. You think it's going to be this tension that might arise between them, but it's nothing, you know, like mm. because that compared to their partnership that they've had over all these years that they don't need to argue. They don't need to talk about these things. They don't need to distrust each other or anything like that. It's just a perfect moment between two, two very masculine boys sitting down and just, you know, having that complete trust and understanding. I fucking love that scene. I always loved it. Um, and also I think that film has one of the best ending shots in any movie ever. When, Colin Farrell, after the gunfight, he takes her out to this location and he arranges for someone to come pick her up in a speedboat and take her away. He doesn't know where she's going, so basically their relationship is ending. And it's like that perfect Michael Mann movie. It's like sunset. No, it's dawn because the sun's coming up. It's like dawn. The sun's just coming up. The sky is pink. It's heavy wind and the palm trees are blowing and there's that guy in his very like 80s looking suit, you know, and both the characters are sad and she's taken away on this speedboat into this beautiful blue ocean at the at the moment of dawn. You've got Mogwai playing in the background. Fantastic soundtrack. It's just one of those brilliant, <laughs> perfect looking ending I, shots. <laughs> I, I actually had a thought about this. Like, oh, if, if, if Michael had ever made a video game movie, it should be Outrun <laughs> because that's... <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like the way like a lot of his movies look like only like instead of daytime it'd be nighttime but beside that's like oh yeah yeah give michael Mad outrun it that would be amazing i would agree about the soundtrack one caveat though that um uh oh, remix oh, of in the oh, air tonight oh, is shit oh it's that's shit. so bad that is so such a bad cover i really didn't like it like that cover is like uh uh it's pretty obvious that, that, that the first time they made that, that song, they didn't know that that drum beat was going to be iconic. But that, yeah. with, with that, that remix cover, they're like, oh yeah, this is the iconic part. They have to push it in, in, in this song as much as possible. And it just doesn't work. Yeah, it's, uh, it's misguided. <laughs> but yeah, aside from that uh, good movie, I, uh, speaking of, you know, typical Michael Mann look and, and visuals and everything, I really like the scenes... Um, they got several of those, I think two or three, where they do something on the water and in the background over, even beyond the uh, city, you see like a thunderstorm, you see lightning uh, going in the night sky. Just, you know, not like the full night sky in clouds, but just one part where it's like, okay, there's a storm coming, which doesn't really happen. There's not like a scene where every, you know, where a storm all around it, but it's like, okay, there's always something brewing in the background. It's like the small detail. And I always like those scenes. I think those, those scenes like stood out. They look really cool. So yeah, that's one of the things I noticed. Uh, uh, should we go on to the next movie? Because yeah, uh, we're it? running out of time. Yeah, yeah, the, really. next, the next movie is Public Enemies. And like, I actually want to talk about the visual style first, because what I find so interesting is that uh, uh, Miami Vice it's like digital and it's like that that grainy look. But Public Enemies is so sharp that like yeah. that it's not that it doesn't just star uh, uh, Johnny Depp. It also stars Johnny Depp's pores because you can see like the pores on his face <laughs> like completely like in close up. It's like what the fuck is going on? This is insane. Like that's how and, sharp this movie looks. It's like it's it's such a like such a uh, a jump yeah, in, but, in quality. It's kind of weird. But, it, and it, it is it, like you say, Brack. It's weird. The first time I watched uh, uh, Public Enemies, I had exactly the same feeling. Like it's so sharp that it disconcerts you. It's like because uh, it's a historical <laughs> movie, right? And you've never seen a historical movie look that sharp. And for a moment, it just confuses you. It's like, what's going on? <laughs> Seeing these guys in these like very like nineteen twenties or whatever. Um, outfits, you know, and with the 1920s cars and, uh, you know, the buildings and stuff, seeing it in such, like, sharp where you can see, like, Brax saying, like, every pore on their face, it's, like, weird the first time you see it. It's like your brain can't quite process it, <laughs> like, for every second. So it actually threw me off 
from the film um, the first time I watched it because it was so sharp. And it's a historical movie. And, you know, when you see historical movies, you expect like a, like a more kind of like a grainy, sort of slightly unfocused feeling to them. But, man, it's really weird. But carry on, Brack. Oh, no, no, that's, that, that's, that's the first thing, like, I want to mention about Public Enemy. It's like the, his, like, fascination with going digital with all his movies. It just looks, you can really see, like, the, 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 the growth of digital filmmaking throughout his, like, his work. And it's, it's kind of interesting uh, to look at it that way. Uh, the movie itself is okay. Like, I, I, Public Enemy is definitely not the, his best movies, but uh, his best movie, but also not his worst movie. It's very middle of the road, in my opinion. But maybe that that's just me. Like I really enjoyed it the first time I watched it because I, it was like one of the few uh, Michael Mann movies I had a chance to see in theaters, and like I was really looking forward to it, and uh, like it, it was a good experience. But overall, I don't really found it all that memorable. I haven't seen it, so I'm out at this point. <laughs> I think the next one neither. So. <laughs> I- well, I, I I I enjoy Public Enemy, uh, Public Enemies. So, but I I, as I said, I think Heat is uh, for me. Heat is Michael Mann's best movie. Collateral is easy second place. Really chasing the coattails of that film, and Miami Vice is a solid third. But Public Enemies, you know, I think that's a that's a pretty sharp drop in quality from his other films, um, of those three. But I like it fine. But when you have two actors like Johnny Depp, actually, I don't like Johnny Depp that much, to be fair. But when you uh, when you have an actor as good as like Christian Bale in the film and and facing off against Johnny Depp, it, it just could be a little sharper, could be a little better, I think. Um, yeah, this but, is necessarily not one of Christian Bale's best performances. Like no. it's, it's very like. We were talking about uh, uh, the usual like cop and uh, uh, robber dynamic and how it was like subverted in Heat, where like it's the the cop that's the the, the one on the edge and the crazy guy, and it's the 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 the, uh, uh, the thief that's the the criminal that's like the straight and narrow. But here it's Christian Bill being as straight as an arrow. Like he's so straight and narrow that there's barely any character left. Yeah, I, I, I can, I can, I, yeah, I can appreciate that. I mean, he's he's quite a bland character, but I guess for his role, he kind of needs to be bland to to play that because it was the 1920s. But um, it's a solid film. It's uh, solid. Um, but the, the one thing that always, always I think it's, it's time, funny that it, it was funny that like I think uh, Christian Bale's introduction scene in that in that movie is him like shooting uh, like a giant hole in uh, Channing Tatum. <laughs> Like, Channing Tatum is pretty boy Floyd in that movie. Like, I think the one of the first scenes with, with Christian Bale is I'm just, like, hunting and gunning down uh, uh, that, his character. It's like, uh, I always remember that, that that sequence. To be honest, I don't even remember that. But, yeah, I, have to, I, I mean, I haven't seen it for a while. And the last time I watched it, Channing Tatum uh, wasn't particularly famous. But, yeah, <laughs> not like he is now. But like, I'll have to watch out for that. But well, something that always made me laugh about that film or – no, not laugh exactly, but one thing that always sprang to mind whenever I watch Public Enemies is bizarrely a quote from uh, um, High Fidelity, a completely different film, where uh, uh, John Cusack has had an argument with his girlfriend or whatever, and he's really angry with his girlfriend. Then you see him walking away from like the Cenotaph Theatre, and he, he says the quote to the camera is like, John Dillinger was gunned down by FBI in a hail of bullets behind this theater. Who tipped him off? His fucking girlfriend. Man, he just wanted to watch a movie. <laughs> Whenever I watch Public Enemies, I just immediately just hear John Cusack say that quote. Oh, man. But yeah, it is decent. Yeah, like, uh, it looks cool. Like, that's part of it. Like, if you get over the edge of, like, it looking weird because it's so digital, like, you have the outfits, you have the guns, and you're like, oh, man, this looks pretty badass. With those, like, and you hear those, those gun sounds, and the shootouts are still pretty, uh, are really solid. And you have those, but it's this time, it's like this old tummy gun sound. So it's like, there's a mm-hmm. different ring to it. So it's like, oh, man, this is pretty cool to watch. But th- that's it. Like, I, I remember Public Enemies mostly because it's one of those movies that they really used a lot in uh, in shops to show off how cool the TV is. Like, it's like one of those movies they showed off a lot in like, in, like uh, <laughs> those like, digital TV shops. It's like, oh man, look how sharp a TV is. Here's some scenes from Public Enemies. It's like, oh, that's how I remember Public Enemies the best. And I don't think, I think that says enough about it as well. Mm. 
Yes, I I don't think yeah the man is that 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 is a dear, very disconcerting thing. I remember I remember the first, like I say the first time I watched it I wasn't even sure I liked it because of that single thing. But I've seen it a couple times and I, the thing is with Public Enemies every time I watch it I like it just a little bit more than I did the last time I saw it. So there you go. So let's come on to the last uh, uh, film uh, on the list, which is going to be Black Hat. Um, I watched Black Hat before this podcast as homework. Um, I had never seen Black Hat before, so I'm, I guess I'll go first on Black yeah, Hat. Yeah, you go first. You remember the best. Yeah, I, I haven't seen... Uh, uh, I haven't talked... To, I haven't been first, actually, in any of these films, come think of it, except for The Insider, and that was shit. Ironically, Black Hat's also shit. So it's a, it's a two for two. So uh, Black Hat, yes. Black Hat is a weird film because it's crap. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just bad. Uh, but it's bad with some really good stuff in there. Like, and basically it's like the entire film is just this really boring ass film with a really terrible performance by Chris Hemsworth. Oh man, Chris Hemsworth is so bad at this. Like, like it's I'm, awful. Oh, I just want to talk about his bad performance because like what I love about a lot of Michael Bay movies where you have like, there's a lot of silence in his movies, right? And you see like the characters' faces, and you're like, and you're like, you see them thinking, you see like the wires going in their head. But with, 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 with Chris Hemsworth, it's like it's just like looking at a piece of beef, like nothing is happening there, like, <laughs> like nothing is happening. Like you see the front of the face, but there's like nothing happening behind the scenes. You can just notice that. And it's like it just doesn't work at all. Yeah, I, I totally that's, agree. That's all I remember because... from his performance. Like, oh man, that's like, oh, he played, he tries. He tries so hard to look intense, like to have like this, this, this Michael Mann sequence where you can see the guy thinking and then something happened and like, oh, there's so something deep going behind those eyes, but there's nothing happening. And it's no yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The lights are on, but nobody's home. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's worse than that, though, because his accent is one of the worst accents I've ever seen in any film Ever in my life so he manages to do the in in thor right he's great because and he managed to do that kind of like pseudo british accent quite well it's great but in black hat he tries to speak with an american accent but sometimes he sounds european sometimes he sounds australian and sometimes he sounds american and it's like it's awful and sometimes like all three in the same sentence it's terrible it's just it's one of the worst accents and like Brack says he's, he's somehow he uh like you say like he just can't do the decision making thing you know it's it's his in the entire film he's got like one expression and it's just plastered on his face throughout the entire film start to finish uh so it's just one of the worst performances i've seen for a long time uh by an actor is quite shocked to be honest by by the by the lack of decency in his performance also his character makes no sense because he's a computer hacker right who went to mit and made some mistakes ended up getting into prison for um for you know for hacking or whatever and then Somehow that makes him an expert on hand to hand combat, able to break guys' arms at a moment's notice. And like, you know it's what? like how how did a guy who went to MIT and you know his his speciality is cyber hacking, how did he become a combat specialist who can take down actual real life terrorists with machine guns and shit? Like they're nothing, like he's fucking Bruce Willis. You know, like I, it just it really doesn't ring true and also he's a, like i say he's a computer hacker yet he's talking like robert de niro you can obviously see they're trying to make him like that like 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 that badass cool kind of robert de niro character and in it doesn't work in any way shape or form during that film um uh, what the uh, uh, let, let's let's uh yeah like like let's go back from chris hemsworth's performance because yeah it, it just doesn't work like it's it's bad it's real bad it's terrible like oh I want to mention one more thing about it. Like he looks like he tries to make this look of, of intense thinking and just like uh, uh, just seriousness. And it just looks like a, a model walking off the catwalk and it just doesn't work. But <laughs> no. you know what works? Huh? You know one thing yeah. that works? Uh, the, guns. The, the, huh? Machine the, guns. The machine guns work. But also uh, 
uh, Hong Kong at night looks pretty badass, and and Michael yeah. Bay knows that, and he he shows that off pretty well. <laughs> that, but that's about it. But um, no, no, there, there are there. There's one other thing about the film that's great, and that is like the, the thing for me. The whole film is like The Insider. It's boring as fuck and makes very well. No, the Insider actually made sense to be fair, it, but it was boring. But this film like doesn't make that much sense. I mean, when you really think about it, not really. But uh, well, it probably does actually. But never mind. That's not that's not the case. I, I, perhaps I'm, I'm I'm rambling. So it's boring. But it is punctuated by amazing action sequences when they come. Like there are there are the, the the end action sequence. To be fair, is a little bit disappointing because suddenly this you know sort of guy who's a computer hacker turn, turns into fucking Vincent from Collateral for a few minutes and is <laughs> is able to do like massive damage on a on a on a wide scale. But there are two other action scenes that are actually really good. I mean, they're cinematic, they're loud as fuck and in your face. And there's one moment, uh, spoiler alert, big spoiler alert for Black Hat here, but it's a bad movie, so I don't think it really matters. Um, There's a real great shock in the film where suddenly many of the characters of the film are just killed, like without warning. I did not see that coming at all. Like I never, I didn't even remotely catch that action scene coming, and then bang, it, the action scene suddenly starts at about like three major characters yes. in that film are just uh, iced I, within seconds. Yeah, like 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 name uh, uh, recognizable actors just take it like out of nowhere, and it's kind of interesting to see that. That's but, pretty uh, cool. Uh, that that is pretty badass. Uh, but yeah, the, the, uh, the movie just doesn't work. And you know yeah. what? Who know who recognized that the movie doesn't work? Michael Mann, because supposedly there they, he made like another version of it. That's like after this movie was all ma- already made and and like in theaters and stuff. He's like, okay, this movie doesn't work. Uh, he made like a completely different recut that's supposedly like extremely different from this version. But you can you're not able to see it because he 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 can't like put it online or digitally or whatever. So. Yeah, that kind of sucks for him. I, I, I guess it must have knocked his confidence, or he, definitely his public perception, because he hasn't made a movie since. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, which is, I guess, kind of a shame. But uh, Black Hat is a is sort of like a sour black spot, and is is a bad movie, punctuated by a couple of really good scenes. And yeah, it just kind of sucks. But there you go. Human yeah. Metal, are you interested in seeing Black Hat? After this rant, no. Uh, <laughs> let, let's end on a good note, though, because. Uh, I just want to, like, uh, I was a big fan of Michael Mann movies before I even knew it, because uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, movies that was influenced by Michael Mann is obviously The Dark Knight. Like, The Dark Knight is definitely, like, extremely influenced by Michael Mann. And, like, I've seen The Dark Knight before I've seen uh, a lot of the bigger uh, Michael Mann movies, and it's like... Oh man, and I didn't notice how influence how much it was influenced. But like, if Michael Mann was was making a superhero movie, it would look like The Dark Knight, like the visual style, the way they actually shot, the way the guns sound, especially yeah, especially in Dark Knight with like the the beginning, the beginning high sequence in uh, of The Dark Knight feels very much like a Michael Mann movie, and that's one of the reasons I really, really love that sequence. Well, there is a good reason that that film is often referred to as the heat of superhero films. Like it's often referred to as that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes total sense. Yeah, it does. All right, and uh, so that's our opinion on Michael Mann uh, movies. So uh, why don't you sound off in the comment section and tell us uh, your favorite Michael Mann movie? Um, and please join us next time. You snag your dick in a urinal flush chamber. <laughs>